evening everybody thanks all for coming i'll just um share my screen um okay yeah so as andrew said i'm lee schofield i'm the senior site manager at rspb horsewater and i am still sort of getting used to uh introducing myself in this way but um apparently i'm also an author um i've written a book wild fell uh which was published a couple of months ago um so i'm going to talk to you about the work that we're doing which is also the story of the book um i'm going to read a couple of short sections from it um and explain how i've come to um set down what we're doing at Hawes Water in uh, a book form. Okay, so I think because Hawes Water is in the Lake District, it seems appropriate to start with a view. So this is the southwest corner of Riggendale, which, one of, which is one of the, the valleys that makes up the land that we're looking after at Hawes Water. And standing in a spot like this makes me feel a whole range of different things, really. It makes me, gives me a sense of or, you know, I share the, the, the sort of the, um, the sense of, uh, you know, grandeur that, that the many millions of visitors who come to the Lake District every year feel that they come, you know, they come seeking these incredible views of the soaring fells and the winding rivers. Um, I feel a, an immense sense of, of privilege knowing that this is effectively my office. Almost all of the land that's in the photo there um, falls within the boundary of, of the Horsewater Reserve that I'm the site manager of. That comes with a real sense of responsibility, knowing that the decisions my colleagues and I make will influence how nature fares across, across a really you know, big chunk of land, a place that is home to thousands of individual plants and animals. And the decisions we make will, will affect how they survive here um, you know, for, for decades to come. But a view like this also makes me feel a little bit sad, if I'm honest, um, because this is a landscape that's full of holes. If I'd stood in the same place a decade ago, there's a reasonable chance that I might have caught sight of England's last golden eagle. After an absence of 170 years, golden eagles returned to the Lake District to breed in 1969. The RSPB word into action, this is obviously, uh, you know, it was a pretty momentous ornithological occasion golden eagles returning after such a long long period of, of there not being any in England at all um, we established a viewpoint um, showing people the birds and thousands came to pay their respects to, to you know these living embodiments of wildness in their only English outpost but sadly in 2015 the story of Horsewater's eagles came to an end the last male which was the the, the third male um, in a short lineage that, that occupies the valley of Riggendale at Horsewater disappeared in 2015 during a winter of quite extreme storms. He'd been on his own for, for 10 years. Every year he would display in the hope of attracting a, a, a mate to, to come in and join him in the territory that he was defending. But at that time, there were very few eagles in the southern uplands of Scotland, which was the kind of closest place that the golden eagles would have come in from. And so he never succeeded in pulling in that mate and his breeding displays, his, his, his um, attempts to, to lure in that mate were, weren't successful. And in 2015, he disappeared. We suspect he was about 20 years old. Um, and during that winter, there was a succession of really extreme stormy, um, stormy weather. Uh, and for a bird already past his prime, he was probably just, he just probably found it too difficult to hunt and probably just starved to death and, um, you know, we never found out exactly what happened to him, but that's what we suspect. And at that point, England effectively became eagleless once again. Every now and again, birds might drift through from Scotland, juvenile birds checking out, have a, um, checking out suitable territories. But they never saw anything that took their fancy and they never they never settled. And I think it's 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 pretty shameful, really, that the whole of the English countryside is incapable of supporting even a single golden eagle let alone a pair or or many hundreds of pairs which used to occupy England many centuries ago but eagles aren't the only thing that's missing from the Lake District landscape it'd be quite fair to describe the place as being a landscape of ghosts this is a building called High Loop and it sits directly across Horsewater Reservoir from Riggendale that's Riggendale's mouth opening on the right hand side of the photo there with the rainbow going across it and High Loop has its name um, derives from the word wolf. So loop is the word that the French still use for, for wolves. And wolves were present in the Lake District until around 
1300 or so. The, the, the le legend has it that the last wolf in Cumbria was killed on one of the limestone peninsulas at Humphrey Head in the south of the county in the early 1300s. And although this particular building is probably slightly more modern than, um, than the 1300s, it is one of a, a cluster of old ruined buildings in this particular location that suggests very strongly that this was a place that people lived with their flocks up on the hill to protect their livestock from predation by wolves. And it is wolves that underpin the whole shepherding culture of the Lake District and, and, and much of the uplands in the UK and across Europe. Indeed, in many places where wolves are still present in upland areas, shepherds still live up with their sheep flocks and they guard them by night in order to protect them from, from wolves and other predators that are still extant. So you could say that it's wolves that are responsible for, for a huge amount of the cultural heritage um, that, that persists in a sort of shadow of its former self today in the Lake District. So as well as many wolf places, um, around High Loop, there's also a wolf crag, which derives its name from wolves. There's an Ulthwaite rig, which takes its name from the Old Norse word for wolf, Ulfa. And there's lots of um, Ulf places around the Lake District, which, which, are, um, which, which relate to wolves. And as well as those wolf places, and there's lots of eagle crags as well, which denote where eagles previously bred, there are places relating to black grouse and pine martins. There are wild boar fells. There are red cats and um, sorry, red kites and wildcat places too. And all of these species lived alongside the the sort of the ancient um, ancestors of, of of the people that that are living in the Lake District today. And all of these species were either intentionally exterminated all the land was changed so much that they just simply weren't able to, to survive in the Lake District as we know it today any longer. Black grouse, which is, um, the, you know, I'm sure you recognise male black grouse in the photo, um, they were one of the most recent birds to disappear. So they disappeared in my lifetime. In the 1980s, black grouse were still just about clinging on in the Horswater and the Kentmere area. So the, the sort of the far east of the Lake District was the last place that they hung on, uh, hung on until. They're still present in Cumbria, um, but only over in the Pennines. And there's, there's, there's no black grouse in the Lake District anymore. They've disappeared really partly because they were hunted. They were, they were shot for sport, but they also succumbed to the removal of the mosaic of woodland, bog and grass that they, that, that they rely on to survive. Black grouse are really um, indicators of a, a healthy, intact upland ecosystem. And that simply doesn't really exist in the Lake District anymore. And it's not just species that are missing. There's signs of what's been lost from a habitat point of view all around the place. So this image shows the bracken, the sort of um, orangey colour on the hill. Bracken is an indicator of ghost woodlands. It only grows in the places where the soils are sufficiently deep and dry for trees to grow. And if you ratch around underneath um, the, any, any patches of bracken, you'll almost always find wood sorrel or wood anemones or bluebells or, or other woodland indicator species showing quite clearly that where bracken grows today used to be maybe many hundreds of years ago but used to be woodland and these are the places really that trees could could be returned to if we wanted to restore some of the habitat richness to the Lake District landscape and there's other clues too ditches and wet ground indicated where a healthy bog used to be that has been converted to to sort of um, more agriculturally productive land Gnarled rows of hawthorns often show where hedges used to be. Sometimes you can find shallow depressions in the floodplain, which are paleo channels showing the roots of old rivers. So a huge amount, a huge amount has changed over the course of centuries to the Lake District landscape. And many of us consider it an incredibly beautiful place, and indeed it is. But from an ecological point of view, um, it's suffering from a whole range of different, um, a whole range of different impacts. And that's all a bit gloomy, so best not try to dwell on that kind of stuff too much. But these clues that are left in the landscape, they can act as a guide to, to restoration. So this small tarn is up on Mardell Common, um, which is, uh, makes up a, the, the sort of the lion's share of the land that we're looking after at Horsewater. When we took over the land, the two hill farms that we're now looking after, Nadal and Swindell, a decade ago, looking over old maps, we saw that there used to be this, this water body up on Mardell Common in this location. But when we looked around on the ground itself, all we could find was this old, really quite small puddle with a, with a significant drain running out of the end of it. 
And by working with Cumbria Wildlife Trust and United Utilities, who are our kind of main partner, who own all the land at United uh, um, at Horswater, we simply blocked up that drain and, and hey presto, this, this tarn reappeared. And what seems likely is that financial incentives that were brought in in the 1950s to try to improve a lot of wet, boggy land for agriculture um, paid a farmer, paid the farmer that was up here to, to, to cut that drain and just to let the water away from that water body, let that, let that tarn um, you know, disappear. And by blocking that drain back up again, the tarn reappeared and almost immediately, um, you know, teal have rediscovered it and reed bunting make use of it. And there are, you know, clouds of dragonflies and butterflies and tall emergent plants like bog bean growing out of it again. So the clues in the landscape, this, these, these hints at, at, at how the habitats have changed can be really useful in terms of informing how we go about doing our restoration work. And of course, not everything was lost. Um, when we took over the land at Horsewater a decade ago, we had some really important fragments of habitat. The most important of those were, uh, was the ancient woodland. So around about 200 hectares of temperate rainforest. Um, a lot of people think temperate rainforest, what, you know, what's that? That's, you know, but actually we, you know, the UK is a rainforest nation and a lot of people don't really appreciate that. But in the, in the West of, UK, um, in sort of Norway, in the west of the United States, United States, where the climate is um, technically referred to as being hyperoceanic, which just means like really bloody wet, um, mosses and lichens, um, trees growing in the canopy of other trees can all thrive and, and make what is a is a really vibrant, very unique habitat that's that's globally globally rare. But sadly, a lot of those woodlands those those temperate rainforests have just been reduced down to these tiny little fragments and so what we're trying to do at Horsewater is to to work with those fragments and and spread them back out into the wider landscape again and I think this photo tells a really interesting story the contrast between the two sides of the reservoir as you can see are incredibly stark and the only reason that the the left hand side which is the the side that we're looking after has so much woodland is really just a historical quirk. It was enclosed as a hunting preserve during medieval times. And so it held on to more trees than the other side, which was a grazed common. And there's nothing ecologically that, that should mean that there couldn't be just as much woodland, rich woodland on that other side of the fell. Um, it's only that sort of legacy of management that has, has caused them to um, diverge so significantly. We also have these fantastic patches of juniper scrub on site, but again, they're really quite small, about 15 hectares or so of habitat that looks a little bit like this. So juniper is a really important species in its own right. It's suffered as a result of high levels of grazing across the landscape. Although it's a very spiny species, its seedlings are, are they don't really take on that kind of spikiness um, until they, you know, they, they, they get to a certain size. And so at that very early stage, they're very vulnerable to grazing. And so almost all the juniper in the Lake District landscape is, is very, very old. And so we've been collecting seeds, growing them on in the nursery and using those plants to, to expand that juniper scrub back out into the wider landscape. And one of the really important things about juniper is its, um, is its value as a food source for particularly species like um, ring oozles, which breed at Horsewater in pretty good numbers. We typically have about 15 pairs of ring oozles at Horsewater and they need the juniper berries to, to provide them with the energy that they need to migrate off down to the Atlas Mountains um, for the winter months. One of the most surprising fragments of habitat that we have are those that are found on some of our crags. Where the terrain becomes too steep for the sheep and, and also the deer to reach, sometimes you find these really incredible patches of very, very diverse plant life. So in this photo, I can see um, wild angelica and rose root, harebells and heather, great wood rush, devil's bit scabious, lesser meadow rue, um, bilberry, you know, a, a spectacularly long list of plant species, all of which are really quite palatable to grazing animals. Um, and, you know, going a long way back, these plants would have been widespread in the wider landscape, but they've managed to cling on only in these refuges where they've got this natural protection from, from grazing animals. These are some of my favourite places on site. I'm, I'm, I'm particularly interested in, in, in botany um, and a big focus of my book is about how by focusing on plants, we can then sort of rebuild the whole ecosystem from the sort of the plants upwards where you've got diverse plant life then you have diverse and abundant insect life, 
and there you're supporting the bird life and the other wildlife further up the food chain. Um, and because I'm so fascinated by these places, this is where I set the opening scene of, uh, of, of my book. And I'd just like to read a little section from that to you, if I may. So this is from the introduction called The Willows. Three straggly trees huddle on the fissured face of Heart of Fell, high in the Lake District's eastern corner. From 30 feet below, I can tell that they're willows, but I need to get closer to work out which species. With plenty of well-rooted birch and rowan to cling to, scrambling up the first part of the flower-hung crag is easy enough. The upper section, a few more degrees to the vertical, is a different matter. A loss of footing now would result in a slide, a plummet, and a limb-breaking landing on the boulder scree below. Few people set foot up here, leaving botanical treasures undiscovered in steep gullies and on brittle ledges. Water running over the crumbly, calcium-rich rocks forms patches of fertile, rudimentary soil, great for flowers, not so great for climbing. Halfway up this slippery mess of a cliff, a solid-looking foot-long triangle of rock comes off in my hand, shattering on the ground below. I retreat with my pulse racing. Working around the base of the crag, I find a gentler ascent via a narrowing, grassy corridor, hemmed in by rising cliffs. As usual, my progress is slow, distracted every few steps by the summer wildflowers. Stone bramble, alpine lady's mantle, northern bedstraw, lesser meadow rue and starry saxifrage enliven the rocks, the poetry in their names adding to the allure of their shapes and colours. The willows come back into view, with just a narrow, sloping slab bridging the gap between us, which I inch across crab fashion. I feel as if I'm reaching hallowed ground. Growing beneath the unruly mesh of the willow's branches are the fleshy stems of rose root, the smooth oval leaves of devil's bit scabious, sturdy heather and vivid bilberry, a fragrant feast for any herbivore. That these plants are still here tells me that none have been brave or hungry enough to make the crossing. The soil is light and fluffy, with the rich mossy smell of an ancient oak wood. Any boot marks I leave will be quickly colonised, the plants erasing the evidence of my visit. Their glossy green foliage tells me that these are tea-leaved willow, a species which grows in only a handful of places in the Lake District fells. No more than shoulder height, their squat and sprawling form keeps them stable on their wind-battered refuge. The promise of such rare and beautiful plants makes botanizing in these crags intensely addictive. There's always one more ledge to investigate, one more unexplored gully with secrets to uncover. I've never made it back to the car anything less than hopelessly late. So a bit like the woodlands, a bit like the alpine plants clinging onto the crags, the farming traditions in the Lake District also are clinging on in a, in a pretty um, perilous state really. The post-war incentives that I mentioned that, that um, incentivised the uh, drainage of the peat bogs and the, the, the changes to agricultural practices distorted farming in the Lake District in a place that, that it, it drove an intensity in a place that, that really couldn't be any less well suited to intensive farming really. And the farming that, that exists today really is a shadow of its former self. If you went back a century, you would find farming in the Lake District as, as, a, as a patchwork of small farms that had cattle and goats, pigs, sheep and geese. And most would, be, would have been growing root crops and vegetables, apples and damsons. There were small, there were small holdings by modern standards, really. And the, the payments that were, were provided by government to intensify transformed these, these small pastoral farms into gigantic sheep factories really. Sheep became the dominant produce coming from the landscape and so many of them were carried that huge harm was done to, to the Lake District's wildlife habitats. Modern aids that were being developed at the same time, big powerful tractors, fertilizers, steel frame buildings, concentrated feedstuffs, they all helped to basically smash the natural carrying capacity of the land and the wildlife bled from the landscape as a result. Hay meadows were converted to silage fields Hedges were grubbed out by, you know, hundreds and thousands of miles of hedges were removed. Drainage was installed and many of the wet and the weedy parts of the landscape where the wildlife really thrived were tidied away. Thankfully, the partnership that we've got with United Utilities has given us a chance to try to, to turn this around on a block of land of extending to around about 3,000 hectares. We've got two farms, Nadal and Swindale, which with their associated common land, they come up, 3,000 hectares makes up about 1% of the Lake District National Park. So it feels like a big, 
landscape. But in that context of the national park, it's really quite a small proportion. So a big focus for us is is on the doing, but then also the demonstrating of, of how we can make the, the ecosystem work better for, for wildlife, work better for people, work better for nature, and hope to inspire others to do similar things. So we're a decade in to the work at Horsewater. I've been in the job for about nine years. And as the climate and biodiversity crises intensify, it feels like our work is, is not something that's optional. It feels increasingly important. It feels like we're playing an increasingly important role in, in showing one way um, to try to breathe as much life back into the Lake District landscape as possible. So we've just recently had a series of landscape visualizations commissioned to help to communicate the work that we're doing at Horswater. Um, and this is the image that depicts what we started with. So, you know, it's undoubtedly a beautiful Lake District landscape, um, but the, many of the issues that I've described already are, are you know, depicted in this image. So the woodlands there, you know, they look quite extensive, but they are very fragmented and they're separated from the surrounding higher ground by fences. You can see the orange colour depicting the bracken, which is, you know, very species poor. It's a monoculture, really, and it, it, it's showing where the woodlands used to be. The Valley of Swindale, which is up in the top left there, shows the river running very, very straight. There's lots of old relic boundaries, which once used to be hedges. There were many sheep in the landscape, lots of deer as well, too many deer for, to, to allow any um, recovery of woodland or scrub habitats. Yes, we still had our golden eagle, but he was all by himself. Up on the fell tops, often we'd find skylarks and meadow pipits and, and, and very little else in terms of bird species. The farming operation that we took over was a pretty typical one. It was fairly intensive. Silage was made and wrapped in black plastic. The large numbers of livestock meant that there was lots of erosion in the sheep pens and other places. There was, the, you know, tractors were used. It was, to all intents and purposes, a pretty typical Lake District hill farm. Change happens pretty slowly in the uplands. Um, but this is what we hope the landscape is going to look like by 2050, once the work that we're carrying out at the moment starts to come to fruition. So crucially, I think this is still, it's still recognisably the same beautiful, rugged landscape. But as a result of the work that we've done, um, there's, by 2050, there's going to be a lot more colour, structure, substance and, and sound to it. Some of the changes that are shown here are already underway. So we're already seeing snipe um, returning to the to the wet ground where we've blocked up the the bogs in some of the the, the blanket bog and the valley mires. Curly were responding in a similar way. We've already restored the the beck in Swindale, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more shortly. Um, the biggest we're already seeing red grouse returning as well, changing the grazing up on the fell top, moving away from intensive sheep grazing to a more extensive grazing regime, a more naturalistic grazing re regime using hardy cattle and ponies is, is resulting in the restoration of heathland. Um, and we're seeing red grouse returning as a result. Tree pipits are coming back to areas of young woodland that we've planted. Key to this transformation is, is grazing um, and, and getting that grazing right underpins, you know, how the whole habitat mosaic is going to is going to behave. So these big vista views, I think, are really useful, um, but there's lots more than, than um, you know, the, the, there's, there's lots more going on that can be seen from this kind of vantage point. So, so we've, we've got some um, visualisations that allow us to look in a little bit more detail too. So up on the highest ground, up in the blanket bogs, the picture on the left shows what a lot of the, the land used to look like when, after the drains had been cut in. By lowering the water table, you expose the peat soil, um, in those bogs to the atmosphere, the carbon in them re re reacts with the oxygen in the air and huge quantities of carbon dioxide are, are, are lost to the atmosphere. Intensive sheep grazing converted um, the natural bog vegetation to one that was dominated by coarse grasses and rushes. By changing the grazing and by blocking those moorland drains back up, we bring the water back up to the surface again. That keeps that vital carbon store in the soils wet and, 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 and turns those bogs into carbon sinks rather than carbon sources. And very rapidly, actually, the, the natural bog vegetation returns if the grazing is addressed. So bog asphodel, um, uh, sundews and butterworts, which eat insects, dragonflies and, and green hair streak butterflies, a whole range of species return really quite rapidly once the hydrology and the grazing is sorted out. And not only does this help to, to lock up more carbon, but it also slows the flow of water 
water no longer kind of shoots through those drains off downstream. So this is contributing to reducing um, the flood risk for people living downstream too. In Swindale, the river had been straightened around about 200 years ago by people that were living in the valley at the time in order to try to reduce the risk of flooding of their hay meadows. So there were at least 11 dwellings in Swindale. It's a very remote and um, you know, uh, isolated place. So the people that were farming there had to make the land work for them. They had to protect their hay crop because without a good crop of hay, there was a reasonable chance that their livestock just wouldn't make it through the winter. So the logic of straightening a river in order to get the water away from the valley as quickly as possible made total sense at the time. However, it had a whole range of unintended negative consequences for wildlife. A straightened river is one that water flows through very, very quickly and it takes away the small and medium sized gravel as it as it flows, leaving a, um, a riverbed made up just of large, large rocks, a really stunted habitat. The levees that were built either side of the beck to stop the water from getting out meant that in the times when the, water, the river did flood um, during the winter months, the water found it very difficult to get back into the channel again. So five years ago, working with a whole range of partners, we re-meandered about a kilometre stretch of the Swindale Beck. And by allowing the water to move in a more natural course and to move more slowly, it now distributes the gravel on the bed in a much more um, complex way. It forms riffles and gravel bars and deep pools and, and shallow, fast-flowing areas. And so by having a more diverse riverbed, you have much more diversity of wildlife. So crucially, that the gravel in that, in the, on that stream is small enough that the salmon can move it to one side and lay their eggs into it as they, as they require to complete that part of their life cycle. And we found, amazingly, that within about three months of completing the work, that salmon were back in that back, back and they were spawning there again. And there was absolutely no chance they could have spawned in the, in the, um, the old straightened channel. We've also restored the hay meadows either side which we still absolutely require to feed our livestock through the winter months as well. But it's not such a tragedy for us if, if we do lose that during the summer. Our survival doesn't depend on it. We're being compensated through stewardship schemes to, to provide that natural flood benefit um, that, that results from um, having a more naturally functioning floodplain flow, flowing through the valley. So we've already seen that the scene on the right hand side there, it's pretty much what Swindale looks like today. And if you visit in June, it really is an absolutely spectacular um, landscape of flowers with this natural river winding its way through it. So as I said, grazing is the, is the most critical factor. So up, uh, up, on the, um, up on the crags, up at Heart of Fell at the, and, and around Bleawater Crags, where we've got these spectacular sort of hanging gardens of alpine plants, by removing the grazing from the land immediately beneath it, we're already starting to see the wildflowers sort of tumble down off those crags and, and recolonize that lower ground. And the insects are following and the birds are following the insects. Some of that is happening through planting. Um, we have a, a nursery operation that, that grows both wildflowers and trees from seeds and cuttings that we collect from site. But a lot of it is happening naturally as well, just, as, just in response to, to, to the grazing that's changed. We've done a lot of learning from elsewhere. So this isn't a shot in the dark. Nothing we're doing at Horsewater is, 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 is um, you know, brand new. Um, there are projects in Scotland that have taken similar approaches and, and, you know, are many decades ahead of us, actually. So we've got real confidence that the, the interventions that we're making, even though they're slow, um, will, will bring about the wildlife benefits that we're seeking. So we're going to need all the help that we can get if we want to restore nature to, to Horsewater and, and to inspire that sort of wider change in the landscape. Um, so whether it's through reintroduction or through natural spread, um, we're hoping that pine martins might um, sort of join the team at Horsewater. We have a thriving population of red squirrels at Horsewater, um, but holding on to them at the moment relies on on culling grey squirrels in, in pretty big numbers, working with the local red, um, with the grey squirrel control people. Pine martins, lots of research is showing, might actually be able to do that job for us. Because red squirrels evolved alongside pine martins, Red squirrels have adapted to their presence and they're small enough that they can escape on branches that are, that are too spindly for the pine martins to follow them. Gray squirrels, on the other hand, hunt. Um, gray squirrels, on the other hand, spend a lot of time on the ground and they are much easier pickings for pine martins. And in places where pine martins have returned, um, people are seeing uh, red squirrels bouncing back and, and thriving and gray squirrels just, just abandoning areas altogether. So, you know, to bring back um, a once native 
species to, to help conserve another native species almost seems too good to be true. So we're, we're looking forward to them making an appearance sometime soon. And they're already starting to spread out from Scotland and they are sort of becoming an increasingly common sight in Cumbria now. We're hoping that beavers might join us sometime soon too. Again, it might be through reintroduction or it might be through natural spread. The Lowther estate, who are our next door neighbours just down the valley, they have um, an enclosed beaver um, project that's up and running at the moment. Um, and as governments move forward and hopefully will be allowing licences for um, free living beavers sometime in the not too distant future, we're pretty optimistic that beavers might well move up the, up the river and um, start to work their sort of wetland engineering magic at Horswater, which I'm sure you've, you've, you've heard about, you know, just benefit a huge range of, of, of aquatic wildlife. So although wildlife is very much the focus for the work that we're doing at Horswater, people are absolute, absolutely sort of central to, to our vision at Horswater, both as participants, but also as beneficiaries. When we took over the, the two farm tenancies, there were a farming couple um, in each of the two each of the two valleys and each of the two farms so there were four people employed uh, alongside sort of casual labor sort of key points like lambing time and, and shearing and things like that there's now 10 full-time people employed at Horsewater so more than double um, many of those people are doing the sort of the traditional tasks of so the dry stone walling caring for the livestock but there's lots of new activity as well so th there's a new tree nursery that we've just recently completed we carry out um, scientific research and, and monitoring and surveying we're starting to develop um, ecotourism opportunities accommodation and, and education and so although it is different to what's come before crucially it's still supporting the local economy and it's supporting the local economy and providing um, the local community and providing you know really interesting worthwhile jobs for people me included um, and, you know, people do find that challenging. There is there is a strong um, there is a strong sort of traditional cultural heritage aspect to the Lake District. And anything that is different to what's come before is sometimes seen as as, as um, you know, not being very welcome, actually. Um, but farming has always moved with the times and must continue to do so if it is to survive. So hopefully that all sounds like good news to you. But as, as, as I said, it, it's not not everybody is is that all that keen on on what we're doing at Horswater and my first few years in the job were really they were characterized by conflict actually um you know and from a whole range of different quarters perhaps it's understandable that farmers might be nervous about a big change like this happening um on their doorstep but but opposition came from some other sort of more surprising quarters as well and I'd just like to read a, a short section which is really the the sort of one of the the reasons that I started writing the book the Lake District, with its constantly evolving farms and an ecosystem full of holes, became a World Heritage Site in 2017. Two earlier bids had been made back in the 1980s, but they didn't align with UNESCO's categories at the time, and so they weren't successful. The nomination document that describes the English Lake District World Heritage Site runs to 716 pages, so it's difficult to summarise what the designation really stands for. It talks a lot about beauty, about farming and sheep, especially Herdwick sheep, the Lake District's native breed, beloved of Beatrix Potter. It mentions nature now and again, and talks about the Lake District as the birthplace of the conservation movement, though it means landscape conservation, which focuses on preserving the aesthetics of a place, rather than nature conservation, which is more concerned with the protection of species and habitats. It celebrates the area's geology and pretty lakeshore villas, its poets and farmers, if you look hard enough, you can find sections that support or oppose almost every possible point of view. But the emphasis on sheep farming is clear. The word sheep appears 365 times. The word flower only three times. Farm appears 1052 times. Nature 92 times. I'm sure that there are lots of people who care passionately about the designation, but I've not met many of them. Most of the farmers I know are ambivalent. Contrary to what you might expect, World Heritage status doesn't provide them with either funds or protection. The Federation of Cumbria Commoners initially welcomed the designation, having described it as a powerful weapon that puts hill farming centre stage. But it's not clear how that weapon is to be used. A couple of years after the inscription, 
a delegation from the Lake District World Heritage Site Steering Group came to Nadal Farm to give my RSPB colleagues and me a training session designed to help us understand what being in a World Heritage Site meant for our conservation work at Horswater and elsewhere in the lakes. They talked us through the cultural concepts from the nomination document and the new paperwork we now had to complete to enable the steering group to ensure our activities didn't impact on the World Heritage Site's attributes. In the discussion afterwards, I asked how the RSPB's presence at Horswater was perceived from a World Heritage perspective. I was told that when the application was being prepared for UNESCO, the steering group had been forced to accept that there were a number of warts on the face of the potential World Heritage Site. One of these warts was the RSPB's presence at Horswater. For my and my colleagues' work to have been described like this was extraordinarily offensive, and the fact that anyone would be prepared to say something so blunt to our faces took my breath away. I asked for clarification, just to make sure I'd heard correctly. It was explained to us that we weren't authentic. Because we didn't fit the stereotypical profile of family farmers, we were considered second-class citizens. They were effectively saying that the only true stewards of the land in this newly minted World Heritage Site were the Lake District's farmers, ideally born and bred here and from farming families, lineages to which my colleagues and I didn't belong. Yet they also worried about the lack of new entrants to farming. It's hard to see how this sort of thinking can end well. So I don't know about you, but I often find in the moments after a, a, a disagreement or a, a, a fight, um, I find myself thinking of the things that I wish I could have said in the heat of the moment. Um, and it was really this that, that got, me, got me writing. So initially I started writing down um, responses that I would have sort of to hand should I be sort of um, accused of, of, you know, being a wart or something similar again in the future. And initially those, those writings were quite shouty. They were quite cathartic and, um, you know, not really fit for anybody's, uh, anybody's ears or eyes but mine. But I started to work at it and I realised the Horsewater is a place that's absolutely full of stories. You know, the story of the, the bracken that used to be woodland, the story of the paleo channels that used to be a river, but also the story of the people that have been sort of ploughing their lives into changing this place, sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worst. And I started to realise that my colleagues and I, that we're, you know, we're part of Horsewater's story now, um, you know, whether the World Heritage Site Steering Group like, like it or not. So alongside the story of the ecological changes at Horswater, um, my book Wild Fell is, is, is also my personal story and, and what it means to, to work in a place like the Lake District um, and to sometimes be sort of feeling like we're working against the grain and, and pushing a, a boulder uphill for the things that we believe are absolutely vitally important. I'm not the only person who's had these kind of um, difficult uh, experiences you know I, there's there's many colleagues in the RSPB many in, in other conservation organizations government agencies that bear you know very similar scars to mine and we're all as committed passionate and connected to the places that we're looking after as anybody is um, and that's that's why we're bearing those scars why we're fighting so passionately for the for the things that we you know that we know are right and that, that I hope you all know are right too um, and so my book, I hope, is, is sort of speaking for a lot of people who are working at that coal face of conservation too. So Wild Fell is also a story of a work in progress, but my hope is that if we do our jobs properly at Horswater, that one day we're going to have a landscape that's fit for eagles once again. Thank you very much. So I'd like to throw the meeting open to questions and discussion. Hi, have you put up any deer fences or anything else to try and get keep the deer down? Uh, lots of different things, yeah. So we, um, we have lots of deer fences. Um, we also control the deer. Well, United Utilities, who are our kind of key partner, uh, they've retained the, the deer management rights, so, so deer are, are shot. Um, and that is absolutely vital to us achieving anything that we want to achieve. So deer fences do work, but you can't enclose a whole landscape. You know, they're just, they're, it just can't be done really. So, so they're really good for getting small patches of habitat going and hopefully producing seed that can then kind of move out to the wider landscape, but getting the deer down to 
a much lower level than they are now is is something that we're working very hard towards and you know that's quite challenging for some people you know the whole shooting bambi narrative is not one that we want to shout about particularly but without predators in the landscape it is just a necessary part of land management sadly Alison can you tell them about the eagles I will tell them about the eagles um yeah so last week we had very exciting eagle news um in that two of the satellite tagged golden eagles that have been released into southern scotland um paid us a visit at horsewater so there's um there's a project that's been running now for about five years in the borders and they've been translocating golden eagles from the highlands so so golden eagles ordinarily lay two eggs but one is laid well before the other one so almost always the one that hatches first has a big advantage over the, the, the smaller one and is usually killed um, or, or just outcompeted for food. So by taking the, small, the, the sort of the second egg, um, you don't generally have any negative impact on the population that you're taking, the, t- taking that egg from. So they've been um, rearing birds and then releasing them into the southern uplands where the population has been at a very low ebb for quite some time. Um, and that project's been really successful and there's now 33 golden eagles circulating in sort of Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. Most of those birds have got satellite tags on possibly all of them actually. Um, and I heard from the, the project manager of that project last week to say that these two birds had flown across the border into the Lake District. But the really exciting thing for us was that they came to Horswater and they only came to Horswater. So they, they, they flew south. They seemed to know... They seem to be able to detect something about Hawes Water um, that appealed to them. They flew around for a while and then they went back north to Scotland again. And so these are juvenile birds um, and uh, young golden eagles and white-tailed eagles. In fact, they fly around um, for, for several years um, before settling on a territory uh, where they where they um, set themselves up and, and, and start to breed. So. Our hope is that those two birds were, you know, checking out Horsewater as a potential future territory. Um, but I think the most, the most, the, the fact that they would seem to be able to detect that from afar and they didn't range around the whole of the Lake District first, I think is just really fascinating. Um, and it reflects the, you know, the, the fact that golden eagles were absent from England for such a long time and then they came back to Riggendale after that 170 year absence and they chose to nest on a place called the Eagle Crag. So it was obviously somewhere that had been used by eagles for a very, very long period of time. So the fact that they have this ability just to sort of completely hardwired to, to, to see the landscape in that particular way, I think is completely fascinating. So anyway, it made us all very, very excited at Horswater to think that, you know, maybe they will be back. We've also had a couple of the white-tailed eagles um, visiting us actually, um, from the Isle of Wight um, and they did a similar thing. They sort of seemed to hang around at Horswater um, before kind of disappearing off, off north again. So perhaps we'll have both species. That would be nice. I think Marie has a hand up. Hi, yes, thanks. Am I right in thinking there was a plan or a proposal to have a zip wire across Horswater or was that one of the neighbouring waters in the east? That was Thirlmere, um, but that was pretty uh, comprehensively rejected by almost everybody. So that isn't happening. Good. Thank you. Thirlmere is the other reservoir that United Utilities own in, in the Lake District, in the sort of more central. Um, how do the local people feel about beavers? Uh, I mean, like everything is very mixed. Um, so there was lots of um, consultation and what have you about the the enclosed beavers at, at, just down the valley at Lowther. And far, there was a lot, lot more support expressed than there was opposition. Um, but as you would expect, there were a, a, a sort of a small, fairly mo- vocal minority of people who weren't very keen on the idea um, from the fishing fraternity farmers seeming very few farmers expressed any concern about it so in a place like the lake district where the valleys are all kind of shaped like this the potential for beavers to to flood farmland is actually really quite limited they can only really flood the valley bottoms generally speaking those places are already really wet anyway um there is 
uh, you know, flooding is a massive issue in Cumbria. You know, we've suffered from really catastrophic floods every every five years or so. There's just you know terrible flooding, and and I think farmers see are increasingly embracing sort of natural flood management techniques. So putting in leaky dams and things, and beavers basically do that for free and they maintain them. So. Um, <laughs> You know, so so actually, you know, there's been there's lots of work going on. So the Wild Ennerdale project, which is out in the west of the Lake District, they're they're consulting at the moment about a beaver reintroduction into the valley there. Um, and so there's lots of conversation going on. And, and yeah, the majority of people are very supportive, and there is a small vocal minority that aren't. Um, so yeah, that's a similar similar situation for lots of things, really. Caroline's asking if there are ospreys breeding in the area. Um, there aren't a horse water just yet. Um, the numbers are increasing in the Lake District generally, um, you know, really quite rapidly. I don't know, I'm not sure exactly how many we're up to, but at least a dozen pairs, I think, in the lakes now. Um, horse water is quite deep um, and therefore not very productive from a fish point of view. So it doesn't make brilliant um, osprey sort of hunting territory. Um, however, we are going to put up a, a nesting platform uh, this next winter because as the really good territories start to fill up the sort of slightly less good ones are going to um going to start to be occupied so there's an island um at Hawes Water where we're going to we're going to put a platform in where they should be pretty safe from any um bad behavior um and they can fly you know really long distances to hunt so even if they're not actually getting lots of fish from Hawes Water itself it's no distance for them to nip over the hill to Olds Water or to hunt in the River Lowther or the Eden, which isn't very far away. The birds, um, the, the sort of the, the first pair that came back to the lakes, the ones at Bassenthwaite, they quite regularly bring in um, flatfish from the Solway, which is, a, you know, a really quite a long distance away. So, um, so yeah, they're in the general area, but they're not at Horse Water just yet. They, they fly in on passage, both on the way north and the way south every year. We all, almost always see them. Um, so we're hoping that if we can put up a, an appealing looking uh, nesting platform for them that they might take to it. Check. Yeah. Um, is the um, National Park Authority a significant stakeholder for you? And if so, what's your, what sort of experiences have you been having dealing with it? Um, so that section that I read about the World Heritage Steering Group, that is our kind of experience of the National Park Authority. So the National Park Authority hosts the sort of the national park partnership um, and it is the national park partnership which applied for the world heritage site designation so um uh, yeah not they're not a very positive stakeholder actually um which is quite disappointing um are they the lake district na the the national park authorities generally have very little control they have very little power they don't generally own much land so they are basically a planning authority and that's that's about the limit of what they can do um so they can they can shape the kind of the conversation and the tone of the conversation and they have a management plan which is put together for the national park but it doesn't really have a great deal they don't have many levers they can pull they don't manage funding for farming um they can't really influence how land is managed. So, so I would like them to be an important stakeholder, but they're not particularly, and they're not terribly supportive of nature conservation. Thank you. <laughs> Marie. Yeah, second question. Have you any contact with the John Muir Trust? Because I know that they are managing uh, a small part. I think it's on the side of Helvellyn, isn't it? It's not a small part. It's quite a big part, actually. Yeah, um, and we do. Yeah, no, we have a great relationship with with the John Muir Trust locally. Um, there's a chap, Pete Barron, who's their main guy on the ground, and I chat with him very regularly. The Lake District, actually, um, you know, there is a really thriving sort of community of people working in conservation now across a whole range of different organisations. So, I mean, I, I work as closely with people at United Utilities, Natural England, Cumbria Wildlife Trust, Woodland Trust, as I do with colleagues within the RSPB. Um, and, you know, collectively, our actions are, are, you know, really starting to add up, I think. I've been a member of the John Muir Trust for, for quite some time, and I know they have a very good record of working with local communities and really getting everybody on board. 
absolutely yeah and they've done a fantastic job of that in the lakes um thanks marilyn sounds like perhaps you've run out of questions perhaps i answered them all in my talk so i'm very pleased with that <laughs> i think i i'm reading the book it's very good i can highly recommend it mm. thanks thanks alison very good of you <laughs> available it's in all good books <laughs> you're checking so it's, um, it is available in the rspb shop now as well um and it's a uh, yeah, it, although it is, it's not an RSPB official publication. It is my, it is my book, um, so it's got that kind of personal slant on it. But I very much hope that it will kind of further the RSPB's work at Halls Water and in the Uplands more generally. That was the, you know, that was the reason for me writing it. But thank you all for listening. <laughs>